Hello everybody, we are live here this evening with a very, very special guest tonight. I am thrilled to introduce to you Shelley Gordon. Hi Shelley. Hi, it's good to meet you all. Hi Claire, um, I'm show myself up. <laughs> no, you'll be wonderful. Everybody's really, really keen to hear from you tonight, Shelley. And um, so uh, basically Shelley ran the Spine Race, which is 268 miles along the Pennine Way in the middle of winter in January this year. And in doing so, raised a massive and astounding £30,723 on the last count for CALM, which is the Campaign Against Living Miserably, um, which is in memory of her partner, Tony, who unfortunately took his own life last year. So uh, just with massive thanks to you, Shelley, for coming on tonight and sharing this painful experience with us. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask you, first of all, just to kind of ease us into the conversation, yeah. um, what your training for the spine race was like. And that's a question from Graham Guy, who is one of my patrons. Okay. Hi, Graham. Um, it was particularly painful. It was awful. Um, it was all over winter. It was when I was running the business on my own before I'd taken staff on. I've got a daughter, three horses. So there was mucking out to fit in. And it was just take off the list, get off early, couple of hours training. It was more on time rather than mileage as well. So I think people still ask me now what mileage I was doing. And I haven't got a clue. I was literally out the door at half five, six o'clock in the morning, try and get back before my daughter woke up. Um, get her. She is a teenager. She's not a primary school child left unattended. Um, <laughs> and then, back home in time to make sure she'd had a breakfast hair sorted and dropped off at the school bus before horses and opened the shop so it was just crazy I got one rest day a week which was a Saturday which is my busiest day in the shop and that was my rest day so a lot wow. of training that's amazing and did you do it all at the same pace or did you do speed no, sessions or no there was yeah speed sessions hill sessions and um, there were longer ones tempo um, I'm trying to just think now what it, what it was doing. Um, the recovery run, so sometimes I'd get a recovery run on, on a, like two sessions a day. So they were really nice because they were like been done with it within 40 minutes. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm back home already. This is so nice. <laughs> rather than just out for hours at a time <laughs> yeah that, it sounds really grueling the training as well as the race itself being absolutely yeah. massive race um but so just take us through um why you decided to do the spine race in particular in memory of tony then yeah. okay so tony actually entered me in the spine back in june last <laughs> it's his year fault. it was so yeah, it is his fault, totally. It was like May, June time last year. I just woke up to a group message um, that he'd set up with Carol and Jim, himself and myself, um, saying, ha ha, I've entered Shelley in the spine. Mm -hmm. So I got up and it was always been on my list to do, but never for this year. And it was it was never sort of planned like six months later. Um, he hadn't paid for it. So the spine entry, as you do your application, they decide whether you can... Well, not complete, but I suppose careful of even entering it, and then they send you a payment link, and then that's your point that you're in. So it was the point of application, and we hadn't paid for it. Yeah, I think you meant to do it within a couple of weeks, but anyway, it hadn't happened. When Tony died, and shortly after, one of my members of staff from my old job, who also died by suicide, and I just thought, right, enough's enough. And if I do the spine, hopefully it'll raise awareness and raise money and it'll get people talking. So I contacted them and said, can I still enter? Can I pay? And then they were kind enough or horrible enough to say yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was how come I entered. And then I thought, right, better get some training in and get on it. It's a pretty amazing reaction to two really tragic events in your life. And I just, um, there's stats that I've read um, on your Facebook and on the Just Giving page, which is at the bottom just here, just if anybody wants to add further to that £30,000. Um, suicide is the biggest killer of men under 45. Um, yeah. And you've got a psychology degree. You've been a policewoman prior to this for 16 years. Um, why, why do you think that that is? Do you have any insight having been through this yourself? I think it's still, and I think I probably put this down to personal experience rather than statistics or anything else, but 
finding from the police and from what happened with myself and Tony that men just don't talk about things they don't share things so if you look at the statistics men and women probably equally say that they that that's feeling suicidal but men are the ones that follow through with that and I think it's 75-25 so 75% of men would follow through with it 25% of women will actually follow through with it so I think and that just comes to women maybe being able to discuss things better and maybe more in touch with their emotions or don't feel that they've got to put on a front for the people or look after their families and be the man of the household and whereas men possibly feel that pressure more and don't talk about things and and when lads get together and chat they talk about the football or they talk about safe subjects it's no it's not you know actually I'm having a really crap time at the minute and uh, I feel suicidal men would never come out with that it's not and they probably don't want to put that on somebody else as well. They think, well, I don't want to share that or tell somebody that. I don't want to cause anybody else any more pressure or problems. Yeah, it's a it's a real sad issue, isn't it? Because so many people could just be helped just by talking. And and, yeah. and you said also that there was just absolutely no signs. Paul Feely, um, he asked a question. Yeah. Um, he's written a really nice long thing. Actually, I'll read it out to you here. He says, hi, Claire, thank you for inviting Shelley onto your show. Tony sold me my first running kit when I took up ultra running. And both Tony and Shelley are well known in the Northeast running community. I was at the first showing of her Spine Race film, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute um, uh, at the Village Hall earlier this year in Stokesley um, and he says mental health is a huge issue in society today and Shelley is doing tremendous work for the charity Calm um, oh he's put Calm Zone um, yeah. he's going to miss the interview tonight because he's at work but he'll be watching later so hi Paul to lay for later um, and hi he, Paul yeah and he would he would like to ask um, she- you Shelley what are the signs we should look out for in a person who may be suffering from mental health issues and what support is then available for those people so yeah okay signs okay, <laughs> okay. So I think for science, people look for the obvious. They look for people that are maybe going through a divorce, um, being made redundant from work, have maybe got a drug and alcohol dependency. And they look. people look for obvious things. And it's just human nature. You look for a reason for that problem. And if there isn't an obvious reason, people can't understand that maybe it's a buildup of things that's maybe been going on from childhood or a buildup over a number of years. Or maybe it's just that's the way that someone's feeling they can't see a way out and just because somebody's really cheerful happy smiley everybody that ever met tony that was why there was so much disbelief around his suicide because he was is so bubbly and and he was always now then buddy and pats on the back and man hugs all the time and just full on and and for somebody like tony to do it i think i think it's hit home with everybody because he's the person that you wouldn't expect to do it and so if somebody like Tony could do that I think that everybody's vulnerable and whether you feel that oh no I've never do that and there's there's too many other things there and I could always see a positive or I've got a big family support and things it's not always that sometimes that things build up and it and over time you might actually feel that way and for people around you to know that it's maybe asking that second question and how are things and running alongside people rather than making the eye contact and sitting across mm. from somebody where it's more like an interview or an interrogation that you think oh actually like I, don't <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say anything yeah I don't want to say anything I'm absolutely fine there's nothing wrong with me but it's maybe like on an ultra and things and when you yeah. feel just so bad and so low and and you're probably mentally more vulnerable that that's like a good time to ask somebody and and have a chat and things and you probably get far more out of somebody and far more in-depth conversation from a complete stranger than you do from somebody you know yeah that's so true isn't it and like I I know uh, I find it easier to talk to friends when we're just walking or running alongside I've had people open up and tell me their whole life stories and all of their troubles when I've been running a long distance race with them and I have like I've just barely met them um but I don't mind and I think that's a message that we need to be getting out is that people don't mind it doesn't burden people necessarily to share these things yeah 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 and I think people that are going through that they need to realize that as well and you're not burdening somebody if if they don't want to hear it they'll tell you that and uh, I don't think you'll meet anybody that says actually mate I don't want to listen to this though people want to help other people don't they that's that's what humans are about you want to help people and you want to 
to make things better. Yeah, and there's plenty of people out there, there's plenty of support out there that people yeah. can access. Like if anybody's been affected or knows anyone affected by the issues that we're talking about today in the show, um, there is a lot of support available. And what kind of support yeah. have you discovered um, uh, since this has all happened? Um, I've not really accessed anything like online or anything like that, probably because I just haven't had time. It's just been so full with with work, with my kids. My 21-year-old's making me a, a grandmother next year. So oh, wow. that's going on as well. And then my daughter's competing with horses. And it's just there's just so much going on. That, but recently I was not feeling great and I recognised that my behaviour wasn't normal and it's not. And I didn't want to put my kids through what I've, ex well, they've experienced it as well, but I don't want to put my family through that. So I've spoken with a therapist. One of my friends actually came in and said, I've made you an appointment. It's on Saturday. Don't tell me it's your busiest day. You're going. <laughs> and so, and uh, and rather than do my normal, no, no, I'm fine, and just and just cancel it or, or anything, I've been. So now I'm, I'm speaking to somebody and just speaking to somebody independent, and that's helping. Yeah, so. it really does help. Like accessing counselling really does it's help. And if you yeah. go through, you can go through the NHS and get it yeah, that way. Yeah. yeah, and I know they have my house for long waiting lists and things, but it's worth looking at other, there's charities that have got things going. I've gone private, but that's with somebody through somebody that I know, so they've, they've organised it all for me. They've just taken the full responsibility away from me. But I'm so pleased they have, because it's helping. Yeah, it does sound like you've got a really good support network around you. Yeah. 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 And lots of people have rallied around and it's just amazing. Your target for the fundraising for Calm was £1,400 <laughs> and you've raised almost £31,000. How does that yeah. feel to, to be able to do that? Um, pretty amazing. I wanted to... I thought I might get more than the, the 1400 by the time I did the race and then I was hoping that I think I got to 7000 by the end of the first week so I was like great I want 10000 and then we hit the 10000 mark and then prior to the race I was on maybe 18 19000 something along those lines and I thought right I want to get 20000 by the time the race finishes I think that's a competitive bit yeah. <laughs> so, right. yeah. I want to try and get that so anyway so then when I came on the finish line they said oh you've hit the 20000 so that's why I was like thank god thank goodness I wow. really wanted to do that and then and then I wanted to keep it open and people were still nominating and then we got nominated for the just giving awards yeah. so I wanted to get to 30,000 for then <laughs> so we made it but we're still fundraising we've still got more money to pay in so there's all the talks that we're doing and the film nights and things all of that money's going to calm as well amazing that's amazing and we'll talk more about the film um a, a bit later on because that sounds uh, excellent I did have a quick search for it I couldn't find the information so I'll no. get you to <laughs> tell me about it and where we can find it later yeah. on it's called run through the pain um but uh, but yeah, you just mentioned that you're competitive about the fundraising side of things. Um, that's really funny because um, uh, I can see from your results that you're competitive in running and, and all things. So Shelley actually um, broke the course record on the Hardmore's one, 160 mile race in 2014. Congratulations. Yeah, um, <laughs> and then in 2016, you were first woman and second overall in the Pathfinders 15. That's pretty, yeah. pretty darn awesome. Oh, I, only did, the sh I did the short route because I, I was going to Cambridge so I didn't have time to do the long route because I've run the long route and done that as well a few times <laughs> yeah so you just did the, there's just the short one just a 15 miler there um and then in 2017 you got a course record on the high hills hedge hope half marathon <laughs> that's a good yeah name. yeah <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, so your competitive Tony was a really great runner as well. He won the Kielder Challenge twenty five mile race. He broke a British twenty four hour no twelve hour treadmill record. Yeah, treadmill. Yeah, yeah, and he came second in the uh, the Clenel Ultra in two thousand seventeen. So he was yeah. he was a good runner. He had everything yeah. going for him. Um, so you you both had um amazing running careers. Um, but. 268 miles that that's something else isn't it that that is that completely different yeah. to anything you've done before yeah I did the hard miles 200 that was two years ago so I've I've done well I've hit the 200 mile mark prior yeah. to it oh, wow. but okay. that, yeah 
but that was um, a May event. So you've got longer hours of daylight, it's warmer. Um, my training wasn't great for it because we just opened the shop and I was still working in the fleece as well. So I just, that was a bit crazy. Yeah. Um, and then, but I was just thinking, right, just get it done and it's, it's all good for the shop and just do it and move on. So I hadn't really done anything of that distance again. Well, I've done 55s and 60s and stuff like that, but I hadn't done, had I done any more? No, I don't think I'd even done 100 miles. No, I hadn't done that before going to the spine. So, yeah. so <laughs> you are a really experienced um, ultra distance runner and off road ultra distance runner as well. Um, but I'm I'm just intrigued um, about the actual race itself. Um, yeah. Because you had a twisted ankle, there was toe and tendon problems, there was a chest infection. You got almost hypothermic. Um, was, yeah. What? What did you feel like on the start line with this huge challenge ahead of you? Um, yeah, when you finally got to race day, how how are you um, feeling? Really nervous, but some of it was a bit of relief as well that you were just after all that built up to it and just make sure that everything had been organised at home and everything was done with the shop. And there was just so much pressure beforehand that just to get to the start line was just really tough. But then when you were there and it was so dark and it was pouring down in the rain, it was dead windy and it was just awful. I was on that start line think, God, I'm freezing. I'm going to be outside for ages now. But, but then again, relief, right, OK, you're on, on with it and it's now just self-maintenance isn't it and I thought I can't control what happens with the shop I can't control what's happening with the kids or the animals or anything it's just right that's it it's just keep moving yeah just one foot in front of the other yeah and, and absolutely was, did you sort of feel Tony there with you at that time like were you thinking about him on the start line um I don't know if it's so much on the start line but definitely during the race I think the start line was more I was more of a panic then because then I thought oh I've got the wrong gloves on my, I've got rain ads I thought my hands are gonna freeze I need to change my gloves and then looking at the time thinking have I got time to get them back out my bag so it was a bit of I had a few moments of panic before the start but then once he got going and then probably more in the Cheviots as well because the Cheviots is Tony's home ground and and that was and then I knew I was coming towards the end of it as well. And I was saying, I hope, I hope you're proud of me. I hope, I hope you realise what I've just put myself through to get to this finish. And it was just so tough. A bit different points doing it as well. Um, high cup neck. That was just, um, I had a really tough time at high cup neck. And it was just really windy. I felt that, well, I nearly went over the edge and scared myself. And Ooh. then I sat on the floor and nearly pressed my SOS button. And... And I was just saying to Tony, I, Tony, just lay off me. This, you're responsible for the wind. Can he just <laughs> can't? Can he just cut things down? I can't go for anymore. So to get into Dufton, I just sat in the ca- cafe there, and I just had a bit of a mantra going, saying, "I nearly died. I nearly died. I nearly died." Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that sounds like a really scary experience because it is yeah. a really tough race, isn't it? Like, um, yeah, the it course is, is really. really- uh, it's a real wilderness yeah. area, isn't it? And yeah, it's it is. basically a bog. There's not a lot yes. of running from what I remember reporting on no. the race a few years ago. There's a lot of hiking <laughs> through bog. Yeah, there yeah. is. Yeah, lots of bog and lots of lots of navigation because I didn't get out on the course a lot prior to it as well, which I know a lot of people have asked some questions about that before. Um, but I didn't get a chance to get out on there because you're A to B, you're travelling and having people available to do that. I could only go on a Monday and then I was trying to make it back for school because that's the only evening that I'm home for my daughter coming home from school. So I didn't want to be out for hours. There was a few nights that, a few Mondays that I didn't make it back home on time and then was ringing friends saying, can you pick her up? <laughs> yeah. I'm somewhere on the horse and I'm nowhere near my car. Yeah. <laughs> so there was, I had a few Mondays like that, but I tried not to make it every Monday because I, I just thought she's just going to lose the will with me and she's been through so much as well that I don't not want to be there for her and it's winter training and it's dark when she's coming home I don't I don't want her back by yourself yeah it's a whole juggling act isn't it as well yeah it's it just such a juggling act and and in the actual race you you were out for five nights so you definitely missed the monday night there <laughs> um but you you came second place overall in 128 hours and 26 minutes yeah. um after jasmine paris who yeah. beat all the men smashed the record 80 hours 12 minutes <laughs> while breastfeeding a 14 month old over 12 hours off the record yeah um, i loved it it's brilliant but, i was so proud of her 
<laughs> I know it's absolutely fantastic. We're going to be speaking to Jasmine on the eighth of January as well. I am uh, um, just b- just before this year's spine yeah. next year's spine race. Um, but I have actually got an audience member. Um, I don't think she's watching right now, but she'll be watching later. Um, she's called Pascal Mathene. She's doing the spine race um, okay. this coming year, um, and she's got a lot of questions for you. <laughs> let, okay. me, let me just um, bring them up. Um, oh, that's not the right one. Oh, where's her question? Um, oh, I haven't uh, screen grabbed it, but I've written it down just here. So I'll just have to read them out rather rather than put it up on screen. Um, she wants to okay. know um, when and where did you sleep first of all? Okay, so first night I had that was halls. I had about an hour and a half in halls in one of the dormitories there. Yeah, so that was hundred hundred ish miles in. So I didn't sleep prior to that. Um, I had twenty minutes in a barn, um, which I know they've put out in the notes of this year, saying like don't use people's buildings or anything um, else. Um, yeah. And then twenty minutes sat on a pavement. <laughs> <laughs> It was just basically whenever tiredness I would take me and the, the line was going like this rather than straight. I thought, right, okay, sit down. I just set my watch for 20 minutes, sat down 20 minutes and then back up again, moving. Yeah, and did you um, get into some kind of bivy bag for that or did you just literally lie on the side of no. the No. I literally just sat with my pack still on, back against a wall or against the seat or whatever. I've sat down on legs straight out in front of me and then 20 minutes, just literally like that. And did you set an alarm for that 20 minutes? Yeah. 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 Ah, okay. Set an alarm for 20 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you allowed yourself and then you got up and carried on. Okay. And so presumably if you're only having 20 minutes or like, what do you know what you averaged over the five day, like the five nights? Um, um, An hour and a half in one go was the maximum I had and that was at Halls. Um, I know I had, I think I had an hour at Old Alston. Um, I was going to have longer, but I woke up and I just thought, well, actually, I'm wide awake. I'm just going to get going. So I, d- I did that. Um, and then where else did I have? Bellingham, they said I had to have an hour before they'd allow me to leave because I, I spent some, quite a bit of time with the medical crews. So I, I got rest, although I wasn't sleeping, I, I wasn't moving. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to waste more time by then yeah. sitting down and sleeping as well. Yeah. So I don't know. It wasn't a lot. <laughs> Yeah. single figures I think over the yeah. full time would you say you got like about five hours or yeah probably about five over hours the, over the whole five day five yeah. nights wow yeah. okay so then Pascal wants to know how did you cope with that sleep deprivation because wow I, I can't even cope if I've had like three hours sleep and I'm just sat on my computer <laughs> editing film I don't know how you're gonna walk as well at the same time keep up right I don't know I think you just get into a little like spine zone <laughs> and then I'm used to I've done shift work and things so, for quite a long time so and because I had my kids young and then they were young while I was doing the shift work I would stay up all day work night shift take them to school go to bed for a few hours get out to pick them back up from school do my next night shift and then I would stay up for my first day off so I was quite used to doing 36 hours no sleep ah. to yeah. So I suppose it's a bit like sleep training and if you're not used to going to bed at the same time every day because then when I went on to, well, shop work now and then doing that daytime and regular sort of bedtimes, you hit like 10 o'clock, half 10 and you're like, oh, God, I'm ready for bed now. Whereas I never used to hit that. I would just always be, you know, when I decided I was going to bed, that's when I'd go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> so you're well practiced. So you can yeah. kind of practice for sleep deprivation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. you can mm. do, yeah. Yeah, so you could like practice setting your alarm for unknown times yeah. and just get yeah. up, go for a run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and Pascal wants to know um, if you had um, low patches, which I presume you did, kind of when thing like thoughts about Tony may have overwhelmed you. And, yeah. Like if you had low patches, how did you get out of them? Um, high cup nick was the lowest patch that I had out of the whole race, and that was, I was excuse me. <clears throat> I felt like I was lost. I didn't know I was going. It was so dark. It was really windy. I felt like I was being blown and as if I was being pushed over the edge. And that was definitely my lowest moment over the whole race. It was the only time I even considered pressing my SOS button, which I knew that was the end of my race. And I just sat down and I thought, no, you can't do this. There's so many people sponsoring sponsoring me and I can't go home and tell my kids I failed. So that was it really I think my mindset was just no you're finishing it and I signed three disclaimers 
and the last one they tried to pull me out at hut one so about eight miles or so from the finish they tried to pull me out there oh my goodness that's that's illegal (laughs) yeah that's what i said i couldn't believe it because they were saying no you're hypothermic yeah we're gonna have to pull you out and uh, that's no did you just literally run away from the hut like just (laughs) i'm off take a hot water bottle and run yeah that's what i wanted to do yeah but i put up a good argument and i I was sensible about it though as well because i thought i don't want to put myself at risk and i don't want to put the organizers and the medical staff at risk that's that's their job and that's what they're doing but i knew that i was more than capable of carrying on and as i just said right i'll sleep i'll stay home until it's daylight it was about six o'clock in the morning i'll get warm i'll eat i'll drink whatever you tell me to do i'll do and then i'll let you reassess me see what you think so they agreed and then they agreed to let me carry on yeah that's really useful information for anybody doing the race because you might think oh it's curtains Uh, but actually you can negotiate a little bit and you can as long as you don't get to an argument with them and start shouting at them then yeah yeah and i think they and they're they're in a position to look at you objectively Mm -hmm. they're not the ones that have been out there out in the cold and things they can look at somebody and they know whether no actually you are capable or not so I think they, they realized with me that I was then capable of finishing it but I don't think that's going to be the case for every single person that sort of says no actually I want to finish and I know you've got broken bits mm. or you're really hypothermic or whatever else it's unsafe to like to let you carry on yeah yeah well it takes some resolve to carry on with well actually with eight miles left you just want to get there with you like even if you <laughs> want to crawl yeah the yeah. longest eight of my life I couldn't believe how long it took me it took me nearly a full day to do eight miles <laughs> Wow, <laughs> that's that's amazing. Um, and so, but just rolling back from that, um, Pascal wants to know how how did you not be overwhelmed by the task ahead before you got to that eight miles to go point? Um, I don't know. I never was. I think I was just on a mission to do that, and it never seemed impossible. I'd done the training. I had the kit, and I knew what I had to do, and. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't ever get overwhelmed with it. Now, looking back at it, I think, oh my God, how did I do that? <laughs> but, but then I wasn't. It was just, I wanted to get out there and I just wanted to get it done and, and to do it for Tony and to raise the money and raise the awareness. And I knew I could do it. Yeah, yeah. And there, there was never, was there any ever, ever any doubt apart from the SOS button? There's no, no doubt about that you weren't finishing. No. Yeah. No. no, no. <laughs> um. So you must be pretty good at all the all the other things that go into running an ultra mar an ultra distance race, like like eating. Like, have you got any top tips for anyone doing the spine race or any kind of ultra distance race on eating? How do you do it? Um, I'm not fussy with what I eat. So I I eat everything and anything, and I like hot food. I like hot drinks. Um, I was having recovery drinks as, as soon as you get and you need a little plan so that when you come in a checkpoint mm-hmm. rather than just get get in and start chatting to everybody and just be you get that sense of relief out well I'm indoors and I'm, I'm not exposed to all that weather and everything else but you need to get that food and drink into you straight away so and I learned that from Carol and Jim as well as sort of knowing myself I know that that was what their sort of plan was that like, it's fine get in the checkpoint you need that drink inside you and make sure you've got so that when everything goes out the window, you've got your little list that reminds you you need your spare batteries, you have to have had your recovery drink as soon as you get in there, topped up your water, just the little things that you think, oh yeah, of course I'm going to remember that. You don't remember it when you haven't had any sleep and you've been outside for so long. You need to have that list there. So you literally have a physical list. Um, yeah. Like, do you laminate it and then pull it yeah. out? Yeah. 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 Of all the, all the food that you need to eat or all the things that you yeah. need to do. And I wasn't totally strict with what I ate, but I just make sure that as, as soon as I went in, I was just making sure I'd had a recovery drink. And uh, the five main checkpoints that I was having hot food and drink, um, I knew that when I got to Dufton, because I knew the cafe was open, I knew I was having cheese on toast with mushrooms. And I was absolutely adamant from the start, all the way through, that I was having cheese on toast with mushrooms when I got there. Yeah. So that was maybe, I don't know, three o'clock in the morning, maybe, when I got there. So that's what I had. Yeah, that sounds delicious. I'm glad they were open at <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I left halls and they said, Are you definitely going to the cafe? I was like, Absolutely. I want cheese on toast. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, it, that sounds yeah. great. Like racing or no racing. Um, and uh, and just uh, that sounds like you're really good with the food. Um, uh, what food did you take along with you? And did you eat like every half hour? Did you have a strict kind of regime that you followed yeah. when you were out on the trail? 
Well, sort of. I was trying to eat every half hour, but I failed miserably on that one. And because I was so worried about my hands getting cold, I didn't I didn't want to be taking my gloves off and, and risking getting my hands cold because I know that once my hands have gone, then that's it. I don't eat, I don't drink, and I just sort of go in myself and I, I just don't want to get to that. So I probably didn't eat and drink as much as I wanted to. Um, one of the things I learned from Carl Shields, because I ran with him for a little bit on the first day, and he's done the spine a f- good few times, now four or five times. Um, he had a little flask of coffee, but he had it connected mm-hmm. up on his um, pack up here. And um, and it was just like a warm drink, so he hand, handed me some coffee. And I was like, oh, wow, yeah. this is just lovely. <laughs> that is luxury, isn't it? Yeah, a, walk, a walking well, yeah. coffee van. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. I'm so pleased to be with him. But I said, oh, actually, when I do it again, I'm, I'm going to make sure I do that. Yeah. You almost need a big pair of spine race gloves with, like, little pockets in the hands <laughs> so that you can, yeah. like, run along with a little bit of cereal bar just yeah. in your hand. You can just go like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I knew it mentioned. You should invent this, Shay. Um, <laughs> so, <Go ahead. laughs> yeah, um, eat gloves like a nose box, a nose bag. Um, I am intrigued though about your gear. Um, you said that your hands get cold really easily. Um, what do you do? You have like uh, special gloves, or do you have like those hand warmer things? How yeah. how do you manage the hands? And what other gear is like really essential yeah. on a race like this? Um, definitely for me, for gloves, it, I had loads of spare gloves as well because once they get wet it's getting them dry again so I had well hundreds of pairs of gloves with me um but I generally run with run the Montaigne Prism prison gloves I always run with anyway all through summer so I had those I had over mitts I actually ran with a pair of buffalo gloves as well I had a pair of Montaigne extreme gloves so I just had every variety possible going I had mittens plus gloves and then with the over mitts on as well. So I managed to actually not be too bad. And there's actually some footage of me running without gloves at one point, which I never thought I would see in winter. Wow, wow, that's incredible. Yeah. And so did you, you didn't carry all these gloves with you, did you? You can, can yeah, you put I drop bag. Yeah, you have to drop bag them at the, the five different places. So yeah. I just topped so you've got up. like five spares. drop bags in each place. no it's one bag it's one oh. bag that goes between all five checkpoints ah. but there's a weight limit on it and things as well but for me I was just making sure that my gloves were the main thing that was was extra in there oh okay so how do they organize getting the bags because like presumably Jasmine's kind of like over there and then yeah. other people are back there yeah. are they people constantly <laughs> shuttling bags or do, yeah. you, do yeah. you have to sort there's, that out no no there's, they organize it all oh, so the, the shuttle between yeah yeah okay so you have one big bag and it goes with you yeah. and you can like access 20 gloves yeah great yeah. <laughs> ah, okay and let's talk a bit about foot care because presumably okay. you you didn't did you get blisters like yeah yeah really what happened blisters. with this yeah what like when did it happen like take us through <laughs> the the evolution of your foot during that 260 mile okay. race so my feet are still wrecked now but I went over on my ankle on the first night so from then onwards, I got had blisters. My little toe seemed to get a bit crushed. I was running strangely, so I've damaged my ligaments, the tendons, everything basically in my oh. feet down over. So I ended up with the medical team again, getting the dressings changed on them, and then just trying to keep me well enough to go. But trying to get your foot back in when you've got your dressings on, plus your socks, and and then your feet are huge. Trying mm. to get them back into your shoe, oh, it's just such a painful experience yeah so, and did you yeah, have was, a bigger shoe or anything like a bigger yeah, pair of shoes? I, yeah I did and I changed into those probably quite early on but by the end of it I think uh, generally I run in a size seven by the end of it I was wearing like li- after I'd finished I was wearing men's size nine and a half shoes and then and then flip-flops at that and my feet were just yeah. huge absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't get anything on. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? When I did the yeah. Kate Rath Ultra, like by day four, I had to quit because my feet were a total mess. Yeah. Um, and I had to wear my husband's size eight shoes, and I'm a size yeah. six usually. And yeah. I, I ran the last day, I jumped in the last day, and I wore my temp mate size seven shoe on one foot because it wouldn't fit into the old shoe. Oh. It's just amazing how they grow, isn't it? Yeah. And when you've got that tape around them. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think my feet were swollen for about three weeks afterwards. I couldn't get wellies on. I couldn't flex my foot enough to get my boots on. So, and we live on a farm and <laughs> there's just mud everywhere and I couldn't get them on. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, like, like hops in January is cold. <laughs> yeah, that's really cold. But like, it must have been so painful. Like, I've had really bad blisters before. It's so painful. Yeah. How how did you keep going? Like, how, um, how did you find that within you? Um, I don't know, leaving Burness checkpoint was probably the worst pain for my feet. The prior to that had been my ankles and everything else, but that was the worst pain probably from the blisters as I left there. And it, every time I put my foot down, it was just so painful. But I'm sorry, you just have to get on with it, don't you? So that's what I did and start trying to think of other subjects and yeah. forget about my feet. Yeah. And were you actually running on those blisters' yeah. feet? Yeah. Yeah. Running. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. That's yeah, really, really impressive that you can like withstand such levels of pain. Um, and um, and I noticed you've got the little flower in your hair. Um, Pascal Mathenay noticed because she was helping out on one of the checkpoints, and um, she said that you had a flower tucked behind your ear. Um, and she said, um, "How did you make the fl- sure the flower stayed there for the entire route?" <laughs> She's very impressed by that. <laughs> I have different flowers, so I just made sure it was one of a, a grippy one rather than a clip one. So the grip one I knew it would stay in. So that was it. And I always wear flower. It would have been unusual for me not to have done. Yeah, so. that's, a, that's a good tip for anybody who wants to wear a flower. Is there any particular reason why you wear a flower? Is it is that a pre Tony thing or is it just, yeah, is it a thing it's after? Prior, it's prior to me yeah. to Tony. Yeah. I always have to, and I don't like that. I don't like it when your hair gets caught on your lips and in your eyes and things. I don't. I, so I've always sort of clipped my hair out the way, and and in the police I used to have one, and I was known as the custody sergeant for a little bit. So I was known as the sergeant custody sergeant with the flower in her hair. I oh. didn't have a name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've always worn one. <laughs> so it's a nice thing to be known for. Um, and um, I, just a, like a final question about the spine from me, and then there's some on the on the group chat, and there's some really lovely comments that I'm going to read out to you in a minute. If anybody's got any more comments, then get writing now because I'm going to read them all out to Shelley in just a moment. Um, but it, was there anything after you? finished the spine race was was there anything that you didn't realize before you did the spine race like that you you learned about either yourself or endurance racing is there anything you learned from doing the spine race that you just didn't know before I don't know I think doing the spine you realize what you can put yourself through and still come out the other side and I know I'm quite mentally tough anyway because I've done ultra since I was at school so I know I'm used to that sort of that side of things but I don't know I suppose I learned that I could finish something and I, I wanted to do something for Tony so this ultra was the spine was just so different to everything else I've done in not only the race and the conditions but for all of what it was about as well yeah it doesn't probably doesn't really answer your question but (laughs) yeah no that answers it totally some people like they have you know like a big uh, like in America they always call it take homes you know like what what was your take out what you take out from the race and that always makes me think of um Chinese takeaway (laughs) but um (laughs) but yeah um yeah um so yeah it's just interesting to 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 because for some people it's like a huge life-changing thing but for you it's just like oh it's just another ultra but it's a bit longer and it's in raising money for this amazing cause in memory of tony yeah it was all it was all a totally different ultra to everyone that i've ever done before and I kept saying that, well, I think I've seen on the film and they've said, have you got any words to describe it? And I said, I can't describe how bad it was <laughs> and what I put myself through. And I'm still sort of at that stage nearly a year later. I still can't really put it into words what I experienced and, and what it was like. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> because it was, it, it was so bad. Yeah. Well, it was so bad and so unique for everything. And it was so emotional and, and so much pain and so long and so dark and, and just really tough. And when everyone says, oh, you got good conditions on the spine this mm. year, it was pretty awful. <laughs> <laughs> really? What were the conditions yeah. like? Well, they were trying, they, some of them got diverted off Penny again because the wind was so strong and it was like minus 20 and things. And, with the wind chill and then the winds 50 mile an hour winds it was just such hard work really really hard work yeah and 
It sounds really difficult. It sounds horrendous. But was there any moment where you just thought, wow, this is beautiful? Was there a really beautiful section? Yeah, well, loads, loads of the courses and going up and meeting the people on the course as well. And mm. I don't know. And you come into you come into the checkpoints and the marshals and the checkpoint people are just absolutely brilliant. The medical teams, I think I was on first name terms, terms with everybody <laughs> by the end. <laughs> So, but it was so nice seeing such friendly faces and and people putting themselves out there and there in the middle of the night for you when you're feeling so low and and helping you and a little piece of flapjack put on my bag with a little Aww. note for me. Aww. Oh, I hope well, I was a flapjack. Sorry, I hope made fun it was and mm. just stuff like that was just it was just so nice. Aww. It was just lovely. That yeah. sounds lovely. That and makes it all worthwhile. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. And just take us through that final few footsteps when you were approaching the finish line. Like, what was going through your head? Um, what were the emotions there um, before the finish line? Because this is like five nights out on the trail. Yeah. The, the last, I remember seeing the four and a half mile sign to Kirk Yetum. I just wanted to cry. Well, I did cry. <laughs> cry my eyes out thinking four and a half miles you must be joking <laughs> and it's all on the and road was, isn't it it's a hilly yeah, road to finish it's horrible yeah, it's it all was downhill such, as well yeah <laughs> it's just such a long way and I thought it's gonna be dark <laughs> before I finish if I don't get a move on I'm gonna have to run and then um, and I was just running and then you could hear everybody and then coming down over that road and that last drop down and then I could see the finish line and then everyone was shouting touch the wall touch the wall mm-hmm. and and I didn't know which bit of the wall to touch <laughs> because I hadn't done any research I hadn't watched other people's finishes I hadn't, I hadn't done anything so and I was like which bit of the wall do I touch <laughs> so Carol the camel walking bless her she was like getting me and taking me like here touch the wall oh bless I so, bet you kissed yeah. the wall like come here wall <laughs> it's such a relief I just I just sat down and was thinking oh god I've just I've just finished and yeah, it's very emotional. My daughter had been brought to the finish for me and she was there and and just people that had just driven and some had driven from London and Manchester and, and just all over to come and see me. I thought, I can't believe they've done this for me. It's just really emotional. Yeah. Really emotional. Yeah, that's so, it's so good. It, congratulations and congrats and so many people have been just saying congratulations to you on the live chat as well I'm just gonna um, read out some comments so um, up to the summit says um, what an amazing thing to do he said um, uh, he said it's this is such a huge issue and you should be so proud of what you've done Um, and then Tom Avery said one of the organizations I work with it we focus on veterans and it's the same issue when they lose track of yeah. life and, uh, and and what they have to do is keep re-engaging um, yeah. Tommy Hughes he agrees with you about there's something about running that fits in with depression and it gives him focus yeah. and since taking up running um, he's run through periods of his life that would have been debilitating in the past so yeah. running that whole talking as you run thing And then um, up to the summit has a question here. Um, He says, uh, did you find, um, did you find the race in itself therapeutic in any way? Like, did it help you deal with the things that you'd experienced? And were you conscious of that while you were racing? Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. I I did because there was just, so from July when Tony died, I opened the shop the day after Mm. and there's so many people coming in and talking about mental health and talking about what had happened and then it was school holidays and then it was all the training and all the work there was just no time to think about what had happened because I didn't dare let myself think about it in case I got too low to carry on I thought I can't I've got children I've got a business that that's my only income Uh, I can't let myself get get low so to be out on that race was the first time that I'd had time away from everything and that the only responsibility was to deal with myself so it, it was therapeutic and time to to shout at Tony and mm. <laughs> say why have you put me through this why why am I out here why why am I dealing with this and but to just have that time and not just have not to be mum and not to be answer queries or questions or be in charge of ordering stock and deal with missing stock and or anything it was just so nice to to not have to think about anything 
yeah Yeah, it was therapeutic yeah that's really good and that's good to know and and thank you for that question up to the summit that's a that was a really poignant one there um um, and yeah just loads of people agreeing with with everything that you've said um uh nigel barnett says he suffered with ptsd for years and running keeps the sad days away um steve steve finnamore says people find it much easier to talk whilst running alongside someone because it's not confrontational and it sort of activates the thinking process so yeah to- loads of people agreeing with that as well um and then tom avery is in full respect for you he said he can only dream of such a distance and the grit inside to keep going that's love <laughs> so he's really impressed thanks <laughs> Yeah. And um, Nigel Barnett said, not only was it a very long way, but also over some very challenging terrain. So well done. Very worthy of praise indeed. Um, Steve says, Shelley, your resolve to stick at it is phenomenal. Um, yep. Uh, Dale Zapple says, well done. Um, Dave Langrish says, what an awesome thing to do in memory of your husband or partner and to bring yes. attention to mental health. Um, and John Gardner says, um, "I uh, he's actually just about to race his first overnight race in below freezing conditions. Um, okay. And he says, uh, it's just a fraction of what you've run, so he's going to think about you for inspiration. And he says, what a lovely person. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and good luck. Good luck. You'll need it. Oh, yeah. He'll, he'll love that. Thank you. Um, and Ni- Nigel Barnett's just come up with a question as well, and she said, did, okay. did you experience any hallucinations with so little sleep? No, I didn't. I was sort of disappointed in a way <laughs> because I've had hallucinations in loads of my races before. I've done the hard ones, well, 10, the hard ones, on 60, the 200. So I've done all of those and I've had hallucinations and sort of got used to expecting them. And normally on the second night of a race and then on this one, I didn't get any. So I don't quite know why. But I don't know whether that was more because I was so concentrating on my navigation and and I had so much more to focus on, so I don't know whether that was just kept my mind focused that I didn't have time for it to go wandering off and into other things. Yeah, I know. Does, have those yeah. other races, have they been navigational races? Um, they have been, yeah. but it's on my doorstep and I know I know the areas and yeah. it's probably a bit more second nature to me, whereas the here was all new territory for me and um, and it was very different. Yeah, and yeah, how, really good different. At, how good at navigation do you have to be to complete the spine race successfully, would you say? Well, I think if you're good with your GPSs and, and all of that sort of stuff, it's probably fine, but I'm not brilliant with one. I'm not used to navigating and then I'm better with the map, but I wasn't getting my map out because I had mittens on and then my over mitts and I couldn't feel my hands overly well. And then it was so windy that I didn't want to lose my map. So I was probably, I was definitely concentrating more on where I was going and double checking everything and doubting myself. Um, yeah, there was a lot of navigation going on for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you've got to be quite experienced and have done it yeah, like definitely. for years and yeah. years before you attempt definitely, something yeah. like the spine race, unless you've just got <laughs> like a sat nav on your watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm rubbish with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and so um, just to kind of round off this amazing chat that we've had tonight, um, I just want to talk a little bit about your film, um, through the pain, because uh, I'm sure everybody is interested in finding out more and and. Really Really seeing that whole spine race experience yeah. that you had can you just tell us a little bit about the film and and where people can okay. see it and find it okay so one of my suppliers beta climbing they were very kind enough to commission it so they own it they organized the film crew to come out we had we got special permission for them to meet me at certain points so the 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 film's actually footage from the race but they also did an interview with me afterwards uh, five weeks afterwards and it is about mental health as well so i think for people that have come to it thinking oh we're just gonna see it's all about the spine it's not all about the spine it's 20 minutes um we've still been doing some films that we've we've got organized already and then it's going to be available for a free download because we want as many people as possible mm. to access it and benefit from it so we'll be putting links out we just need to get that sorted with dates and things but we'll put something out for it Brilliant. and it'll be on Vimeo I think it'll be on mm-hmm. so it had it there was a showing locally to you and you did a Q&A yeah um, but yeah. people can't watch it right now we'll just we'll wait no, until the link okay yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Brilliant. Yeah. Well, um, I'll keep an eye out for it as well, and I will okay. um, definitely yeah, alert people to that. Yeah, yeah. cuz I definitely need to um watch that film as well. Um, cuz yeah, it just sounds amazing. I I don't know how you like a like just doing the spine race in itself, 268 miles, absolutely incredible, but to do it in memory of Tony and to have all those like all those like sad thoughts going through your head and and all the different emotions, it just it just makes it twice as hard. So congratulations from me Thank and you. everybody watching for just totally smashing it and being a total badass. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. It might be the end of my running career there. I've hardly run <laughs> Oh, really? Really? Oh, well, yeah. I was. that was yeah. going to be my last question, actually, uh, that I was just wondering <laughs> what your plan's next, like either running-wise or not running-wise, as, as the case may be. Um. All I'm doing at the minute is the local Fell Series, Esk Valley Series. So I've just done my second one of the Winter Series on Sunday. And I've not really got back into double figures. It's the first year since maybe I was about 20 that I've only done one ultra in a year. So it's really strange for me. I'm 42 now. It's it's really weird. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so, That's a lot yeah, of ultras. So I don't, yes yeah, so I don't really know what's on the market for next year it's going to be around my, my daughter competes with her horses so it's going to be around how how she's getting on and what she's got planned as well so we'll just have to see and try and get back to some some level of fitness would be nice yeah well yeah, yeah. well all the best of luck and massive congratulations just firstly on finishing the race and coming second lady and then also uh, for raising that fantastic amount through 31,000 pounds almost for calm and if anybody would like to donate I have put a little I've put um just on the bottom of the screen I've put your just giving um fundraising website address there so that people can let's get it up to 31,000 come on guys (laughs) it's almost (laughs) there it's almost there (laughs) thank you (laughs) yeah so I'd just like to say a massive so thank you to you Shelley for the live broadcast tonight I know it's like a lot of difficult things to talk about but it's really important yeah. to keep talking about this um yeah, and if there's, absolutely. yeah and if there's one sort of parting message to to um to anyone who's been affected by this the what we've been talking about tonight um what would be your parting message the most important thing to say to people suffering I think if it's you that's going through it and and I've reached some very low places after what's happened with Tony and I think just don't make any end decisions in that in that few seconds because all it takes is a few seconds to change your life background again and speak to somebody and just ring somebody or text them and if they don't reply I don't just think well no one cares about me that's the end that's that's it just send another message or ring somebody else or text somebody else or if you don't feel comfortable doing that go online look for a number ring somebody don't just don't just end it because life's worth living and and it doesn't have to be like this forever it's it's not going to be bad yeah there's there's good things out there and you just need to take that step and yeah and go with it treat yeah. it like an ultra the treat mm. like an ultra it's one step at a time and just go for it yeah and don't make any decisions when you're in a yeah. really low place about no, anything don't at all like no. nothing no decisions no. at that point no definitely yeah. not and then don't set the bar too high don't just think well tomorrow or in the next hour i'm fixed don't mm. just put it back put it back a level mm. and just do one step at a time yeah that's very wise advice and have you got any um advice for anybody who is on the other side like trying to help someone through this or or if somebody maybe texts you saying ah and you're like oh my god what do i say in reply what what should people do um depending how well you know them and who it is as well and and if it's if it's a child that's doing it there's probably different support mechanisms when there is different support mechanisms than there is for an adult but just be there and if you're the person that's living with somebody that's going through that tough time just don't uh, try not to take it personally when things are said and and just check up on them and even if it's it doesn't always have to be like in your face checking up but and don't and if they're all happy and cheerful and you think oh brilliant we're through it sometimes that's a precursor to no they've made a decision no that and that's it now so don't just think that's the end of it. Just make sure they've got help and you're making sure that they keep that help going and you're there for them. 
And it's tough. It's tough whichever side mm, you're on. It's tough. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, And the main message, get help. Like, it's not just, you don't have to pay on your own. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely not. There's loads of help out there. And it doesn't just have to be medication. It doesn't have to just be sitting in a one-to-one room thinking, oh, great, I'm sat on a couch (laughs) and feeling like a guinea pig or whatever it is. It's just, there's loads of things out there. You need to find what works works for you and what interests you've got. And there's help groups around probably every interest going. So whether it's gardening or whether it's running groups or whether it's a walking group or or whether it's a knitting group or something there is there's loads of stuff to go out to go for just yeah. join something and do it yeah and get running just keep yeah. running <laughs> yeah yeah definitely <laughs> keep fantastic running. that's amazing well thank you so much for all your great advice tonight Shelley and thank you for joining us and just sharing your experiences and, and giving us so much great tips on mental health and also on the spine race itself I'm sure people will really really love love to watch this back later as well <laughs> so <laughs> thanks Dad. that's brilliant awesome well we're going to say goodbye now to the live okay. chat um and yeah and uh, thank you so much it's been great <laughs>